Good evening and welcome to the show that picks up where other news programmes finish. Tomorrow will be cloudy and cold with occasional showers. <laughs> in the news this week, at the Middle East Peace Conference in Madrid, James Baker finally admits that he's being sponsored by Freeman's Catalogues. <laughs> On the roads, the government announces new measures to combat the menace of speeding traffic signs. <laughs> On Ian Hislop's team this week, a comedian and actor noted for his Rosencrantz in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, his Billy Markham in The Devil and Billy Markham, but primarily for his Man 2 in the Carling Black Labour ads, <laughs> Stephen Cross. And at Westminster this week, MPs and journalists were surprised to see a punch-up between the political editors of The Guardian and The Daily Mirror. The Guardian man won, so he therefore gets to be Paul Merton's guest this week, Michael White. So let's march blindly into round one, in which we show each of our assembled companies some footage of a major news story of the week. Well, I hope it's it not the news story of the week. <laughs> no, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, so that gives me nothing at all to say. <laughs> Which will uh, make a pleasant change for some of them. <laughs> Ian, uh, Ian and Steve, whose is this uh, triumphant return? Oh, folk dancing. Yeah. Scylla. <laughs> that's it. Uh, oh, no, that's uh, yeah, Milda, Milda Marcos buying some very expensive nail varnish. <laughs> yes, it was. Well, identified Imelda Marcos, wife of the former president of the Philippines, who uh, flew into Manila Airport to be greeted by 10,000 adoring shoe manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Marcos, who wears bulletproof bras, she obviously doesn't mind if someone shoots her through the temple, so long as her breasts remain intact, <laughs> uh, keeps the body of her husband in cold storage at her home. Hope she goes to the right freezer when she wants a pizza. <laughs> This anchovy's a bit crunchy. <laughs> Paul, and, uh, Paul and Michael, who's responsible for this slip-up? Um, is this something about um, leaves falling on the line or something? The wrong mm -hmm. type of leaf? Wrong time, of <laughs> wrong time of year, too. Sort of deciduous leaf or something. In autumn, wholly unreasonable. Yeah. <laughs> no advance notice. That's about it, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That's the long and the short of it. It's uh, British Rail and their new Class 159 trains, which are unable to operate due to leaves falling on the track. <laughs> <laughs> British Rail do have a device for clearing the tracks known as a Swedish scrubber. Uh, <laughs> Project London is unavailable for comment. <laughs> but, uh, their immediate remedy is to pour a mixture of sand and glue on the rails. Sadly, however, this is washed away by rain. Seems their every move is hindered by freak weather conditions. <laughs> Ian, uh, Ian and Steve, uh, who's had the removal men in here? Yeah, the cabinet. Yes. <laughs> Is this um, a Liverpool question? Uh, People being arrested normally are. It's uh, <laughs> it's more West more Midland really. West Midlands. Oh, yeah. Mm. Is, this yeah. is the West Midlands serious serious furniture removal department. <laughs> Those yes. It's I think it's a raid on them to try and get some evidence. It's pretty pointless. They never used to bother in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the headquarters of the West Midlands Serious Crime Squad, who were disbanded two years ago. This week, the official Police Complaints Authority report into the squad was issued, revealing the full extent of its corruption. The report said that members of the squad were inadequately supervised, had developed bad habits, and had poor interview techniques, and now understood to be taking over from Amanda de Cadenet on the world. <laughs> And uh, finally, in this round, Paul and Michael, who's this jubilant victor? Isn't that boring? Isn't it boring to the film? <laughs> <laughs> William, William Roach, who, Ken Barlow, who somebody, the son described him as boring. Isn't it boring? <laughs> <the film? laughs> it is, really. And he sued them. It was his turn. Yeah, he sued them, which yeah. was an extremely boring thing to do, I think. Mm. And mm. Uh, he won. Which is why he's taken over from Steve Davis as Ken Interesting Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he a druid or something? Yeah, yeah, he's a druid. He's a druid. That's it's quite true. interesting, so it's yeah. not very likely, is it? Yes, it's true. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Roach is, a, of course, a, a druid, as, uh, as uh, Michael just mentioned. <laughs> Which uh, does almost look interesting. Mm. On which uh, intriguing. He's been to hell and back. You see that? It looked to me as if he'd been to the Madrid talks to negotiate and back. But, uh, <laughs> looks like he'd may have got the headgear wrong. Looks like he'd been to Brentford Nylons and back. <laughs>
on which, uh, on which note we reach the conclusion of, uh, of round one. And I can tell you that, uh, well, Ian and Steve have an, a tiny four, and Paul and Michael have an only slightly larger five. So time now to give our guests their homework to be handed in at the end of the programme. Paul and Michael, this is yours. <laughs> Ian and Steve, this is for you. And between now and the end of the show, you have to come up with a whimsical caption or a note from your mother. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to ask you to concentrate on four headlines, lovingly ripped out of this week's tabloids, and attempt, if you dare, to explain them. Bang! Paul, uh, what do you make of that? Ah, yes. Um, this is the, uh, the, the Irish equivalent of the Territorial Army, who um, were practicing one weekend. The Territorial Army is a marvellous idea. If the war breaks out, would be fine as long as it's at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, they... And they've got to be over by Monday because they've got to go back to the bank, you know. Yeah. Um, they'd run out of bullets, and so they had to shout out, bang, when they shot somebody. It's incredible, but it's true, yes. Two points. It's, uh, it's the news that the Irish Territorial Army is so short of money that soldiers in County Wicklow uh, have not been issued with any bullets. And they have to run out of the bushes shouting bang instead. <laughs> not sure how, any, uh, how one side ever wins, as presumably whoever's being shot at simply shouts missed. <laughs> Uh, the tank division have been running into battle shouting boom boom. <laughs> the medical corps have been running across the fields going nino nino. <laughs> and the submarine crew still haven't reported back yet. <laughs> uh, Michael, who's providing jobs for the wives? This is an imaginative job creation scheme created by the government. Very flexible. Uh, you don't have to have any particular qualifications. You do just have to be married to a member of the government. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> or, or Susan Parkinson's wife. Perhaps. Susan Parkinson's wife is one of these people who have become chairman of a health authority or something like that. Very useful. Yes, mm. yes, yes, well, yes. <laughs> yes. Lots of free condoms there. <laughs> Yes, you're absolutely right. It's the fact that well-paid jobs in uh, charge uh, of the new trust hospitals have been given to the wives of Tory MPs Cecil Parkinson and Teddy Taylor and the husband of Tory MP Gillian Shepherd. Of course, it's not surprising Mrs Parkinson has taken a job in charge of a hospital. It's the only time she gets to see Cecil pacing up and down outside the maternity ward. <laughs> um, right, Steve, uh, a musical what? riddle for you. What? Oh, Reggae fans Reggie, drunk Reggie, up. Fa Reggie fan. Uh, this is a bloke, I think he was in America, who liked listening to loud music. And his neighbours complained, and he got booked, I think, by the police. And they put, for his punishment, they put him in a room and made him listen to Montevani, the best of Montevani or something. Yeah, absolutely right. It's an extraordinary story. I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's psychic. It's extraordinary. Yes, uh, Rastafarian Zachary Brown was his name. He appeared in court in Monroe County, Florida, uh, charged with playing reggae music too loudly in public. Uh, Judge Wayne Miller sen sentenced him to spend two hours a day for 30 days in the lift at the county library listening to easy listening music by the 101 Strings Orchestra. <laughs> I think I'm going to be sent to Alcatraz for life. <laughs> So it shows the difference between judges in America and Britain. Over here, most judges would consider the 101 Strings Orchestra an example of dangerous, drug-crazed rock and roll. <laughs> and finally, Ian, a headline dripping with royalty for you. Charles and King Edwards. It's something to do with Charles going to the Hebrides, where he often goes when he's had enough of the pressures of playing polo. <laughs> and uh, he went to find himself. And he found Selena Scott, which must have been a nice surprise. <laughs> uh, and a lot of potatoes, he which did. he picked, hence he... the King Edwards. Excellent. Perfect answer. Two points. It's Prince Charles, who's gone to the remote island of Bernaray in the Outer Hebrides in order to experience the joys of simple Gaelic life, accompanied by uh, only Selena Scott and a production crew of 35. <laughs> Apparently, the prince has spent his time wandering around the fields, digging up potato plants, obviously looking for a little conversation. <laughs> more interesting than talking to Selena Scott. Uh, the idea uh, behind the film is to capture a slice of everyday life in the Hebrides. Simple Highland crofters spending their day watching the future king of England digging up their vegetables. <laughs> surrounded by 35 people in designer anoraks. <laughs> Which a rather grotesque vision brings us to the end of round two. And uh, intriguingly, Ian and Steve have a rather lacklustre eight. And Paul and Michael have a gleaming nine. already in which each team gets a, an absurd concoction of visual and musical clues which together suggest a certain news story of the week. So stand by to unravel this lot. Uh, Ian and Steve, what's all this then? 
Uh, it might be true, but it's not the right answer. Uh, um, Paul and Michael, any ideas? Is it, um, is it this sort of new acronym to replace yuppie? It is. Yaki. <laughs> yes, that's one of them, yes. Yeah. And um, um, batty. There's another. Oystery. Good. Yeah, 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 we're getting we're getting now, what about yeah. car phony? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or just phony for sure. Yes, exactly. I'll give you a... Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of points for that. It's the uh, reference to the six new uh, social categories that uh, Access claim to have identified to replace the old yuppie acronym. Uh, there are now yaks, which are young, adventurous, keen, and single. That's me. <laughs> and uh, owls are older, with less stress. That's Ian this week. <laughs> and then uh, there are... <laughs> there are uh, Bats, clams, ewes, and mice, which are uh, money is coming easier. That must be a very small group. <laughs> so uh, if someone says to you, a couple of mice I work with are retiring next week, you'll know that they either work for access or are on dangerous drugs. <laughs> there is an additional category, of course, uh, specifically for the Duke and Duchess of York and the Prince and Princess of Wales. They became corgis, or couple on royal guaranteed income. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, who cares what Access uh, think anyway? They're just a bunch of wealthy accountants, no kids, extremely rich. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and uh, Michael, strut your rump to the funk here. Um, rap record, oh yes, this is um. Can I talking rap? <laughs> <laughs> It's a long player. <laughs> this is something somebody took. Um, oh, look, the beast. Did you see? They were cutting bits off Mr. Clinton. <laughs> yes, fancy dress. The, 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 um, there was a, what I believe the young people call a bootleg tape made of a recording <laughs> which was never officially transmitted by the British Broadcasting Corporation, mm -hmm. in which uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kinnock and Mr. James Nocte, the boarding person you saw in the film, uh, mm -hmm. were seen exchanging a few frank views about. British political situation, and uh, uh, there has been a, 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 a reggae rap number made of it, and the BBC went to court to stop it ever being transmitted. <laughs> On the BBC, you might think they need no need to go to court, but they like spending our money. <laughs> I think that was a very full answer. I think it's <laughs> Uh, the judge said, who is M.C. Hammer? <laughs> <laughs> who is Neil Kinnock? <laughs> well, that's fair enough. No one knows who Kinnock yeah, is. That's reasonable. Still, we could one day have a Prime Minister who's been number one in the charts. Obviously, a bit unlikely that he'll ever be Prime Minister, but... Uh, <laughs> the, lyric, the lyric states that he's bad and he's rad, just to translate the uh, street jive for you. Bad means good, obviously, and he's rad means Mr. Kinnock's radical. Unless you're a plumber, of course, in which case it means Mr. Kinnock's a radiator. <laughs> so it's, uh, slightly more plausible, some might think. Uh, the Neil Kinnock's <laughs> radical? God, where have they been? The, uh, the record is a scratch mix, in fact, which means it's been elongated by playing the same section over and over again. Don't know why they didn't just use one of his speeches. <laughs> And uh, so we roll back the curtains of time as we set off down the road of golden memories to the land of bygone days. Or to put it another way, we're going to show you a lot of scratchy old film footage that Pathé News didn't want anymore. Uh, Ian and Steve, and especially venerable antique for you, can you identify him and what happened next? Hello, look who's that. It's Kenneth Branagh in a black and white flashback. <laughs> 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 kissing, ki in the surreal flashback, kissing a cycle lamp played by Emma Thompson. <laughs> it's called Dead Again and it's about Michael Foote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any idea what happens next? He, he, he lost the something. The Sorry, you both say one thing. Very funny, I can't say it again because it's, you know... Brilliant. It's I fantastic. Love it. yeah. We'll double laugh on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it could be, but um, it isn't.
Um, well, let's just have a look. A member of the Labour Party executive, Mr. Foote was re-elected, though there was a moment when his supporters feared that their hopes would suffer a letdown. Yes, it's uh, the young didn't... John Major there, I think, <laughs> during the 1951 election, letting down Michael Foote's tyres with those enormous sticky-out ears that all small boys seem to have in 1951, presumably <laughs> available on the National Health. <laughs> Still, uh, Michael Foote didn't let a couple of flat tyres ruin his political career. He preferred to wait 30 years and do it himself. <laughs> Paul and Michael, two points if you can identify this erudite statesman addressing a crowd of potential voters. <laughs> the style is Margaret Thatcher. Who do we think of? Rhodes uh, Poison, uh, advocating corporal punishment. <laughs> Helsham? Well, I think Lord Helsham, myself, I might be wrong, who was chairman of the Conservative Party in his youth, and therefore the man he's sitting in the crowd is the director general of the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not certain about Yes, that. no, you're absolutely recently right. As he was. It is the recently retired Lord Chancellor, Lord Helsham. Yeah. Two points. Uh, I think he was bonkers even then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, astonishingly, he actually won that election. So there's a lesson for all budding young politicians. <laughs> Never mind kissing babies, just indulge in some gratuitous physical violence. <laughs> so uh, at the end of that uh, archaic round, I can tell you that uh, Ian and Steve have a slightly flimsy eight, and Paul and Michael have a pleasantly pert fifth. So let's mosey on down to our odd one out round in which we show each of the uh, panellists a fab foursome. One of them stands out like a sore thumb. Your job is to tell us which one is the Ringo. Paul, we've uh, gone easy on you this week. Keith Richard. Fergie. Norman Tebbett. And Mike Smith. <laughs> it's it's helicopters, isn't it? It's, Fergie won't talk about is. helicopters. Mike Smith's proved he can't fly helicopters. <laughs> Norman Tebbit's an ex-pilot or something. Um, so Keith Richards is the other one out. They're all alive except Keith Richard. <laughs> well, you're, you're virtually right, Paul. It's uh, it's Keith Richard, as all the others have pilots' licences. Uh, Keith Richard, of course. Uh, I don't think I, that's what I said. You did. So say I'm it. virtually you right. right. Yeah. You did. Thank you for giving me. I'm only giving you two points. And it's... Keith Richard can fly in his own front room. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so Fergie has a pilot's licence, so it's slightly cheaper to buy her own aircraft and pay for the airfares for all of her holidays. <laughs> and Norman Tebbit was an airline pilot for BOAC, as you mentioned, and get on your plane and look for work. <laughs> and uh, Mike, Mike Smith has a helicopter licence, but unfortunately no longer has a helicopter. <laughs> so he's currently residing in an elm tree outside Gloucester. <laughs> uh, Michael, a multinational conglomerate for you. Mikhail Gorbachev. Milton Friedman. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and it's that man again. Um, uh, on the face of it, Mother Teresa's the only one who's won the Chelten Girl Cup. Um, <laughs> alternatively, alternatively, Gorbachev lives in Moscow, um, uh, Friedman in Chicago, Saddam Hussein probably in Baghdad, Mother Teresa in Calcutta. She's again the odd one out. She's the only one uh, whose city has a working lavatory. <laughs> <laughs> alternatively, She's the, only one who, she's the only one who wears a bath towel. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, she, she's just out of the shower. Uh, Saddam Hussein hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely right. Saddam Hussein is the only one not to have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Mysteriously overlooked by the judges. <laughs> Gorbachev uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for so humanely massacring a lot of Lithuanians. Uh, economist Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize for kindly unleashing monetarism on us. Bless him. And uh, Mother Teresa, or to give her her real name, Agnes uh, Bonkser Bajaxiu, uh, won it the same year as she won the All Calcutta Shriveled Walnut Lookalike competition. <laughs> Obviously the best target, Milton Friedman, yeah. Saddam Hussein. Yeah, let's get Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> Shriveled old walnut, what's she ever done? <laughs> uh, who's next? Albert Schweitzer. Bastard! <laughs> Steve, an odd uh, cocktail for you. Okay. Tony Benn. Yeah. Tony Blackburn. 
got the link so far. <laughs> Ronald McDonald That's there. Blown it. And uh, Emperor Bacassa, the Emperor former Bacassa, Central yeah. African yeah. dictator. Yeah. Um, uh, Tony uh, Blackburn, Tony Blenn, and of course, this, the odd man out is uh, Ronald McDonald because uh, Mr. Bacassa's first name is Tony. Tony <laughs> 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 I used to walk his dog, do I know? That's right. Where do you want them, uh, Tony? Where do you want the dogs this week, Tony? Yeah, Tony again. <laughs> Nothing gets past you, does it? Um, I can't give you any marks for that, I'm oh, afraid. I think this is a. Uh, is this an eating joke? Yes. Emperor Bacassa used to eat the remains of people in fridges. Um. Ronald McDonald used to get people to eat Big Macs. <laughs> <laughs> and the other two aren't connected at all. Um, the answer is that they're all vegetarians. It is an eating question. All vegetarians except Bacassa, uh, a member of whose uh, a number of whose a number of whose enemies, uh, when he was deposed, were found in his fridge. Uh, food that literally disagreed with him. <laughs> Attorney, Attorney Blackburn announced that meat was murder, and then so is listening to him for any length of time. <laughs> and uh, actor Jeffrey Giuliano, who plays Ronald McDonald in the commercial, also decided to stop eating meat. I think it was around take 37. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, Ian for Dashing Young Blades. Anthony Blunt. Rhyming slang again. <laughs> Lord Kagan, Lord. Donald Sindon, and Guinness crook Jack Lyons. Right, well, the link here is um, its titles. Um, Sir Anthony Blunt had his title stripped. Um, he did. When it was found out he was a leading homosexual. Sorry, when it was found out he was a spy. Um, Lord Kagan, um, he was a crook who hung around um, Harold Wilson. Sir Jack Lyons, uh, it's amazing the people politicians hang around with, isn't it? And give their honours. He was one of the Guinness Four, um, and I suppose the point about Donald Sindon is he's never been offered a title. Mm. And uh, wouldn't he just love to be, yes. <laughs> Lord Kagan was stripped of his knighthood when he was convicted of theft and false accounting. Although, interestingly, he wasn't stripped of his lordship. Clearly, being a lord and being a thief are regarded as entirely compatible. <laughs> Uh, which uh, brings us joyously to the end of that round, uh, at which point Ian and Steve have a slightly flimsy 11, and uh, Paul and Michael have a thoroughly professional 18. And so we glide effortlessly into our missing words round, the quick-fire round we've all come to know and love, because it's the last one, in uh, which each team is shown some headlines of the week, but with one or two words missing. The teams have to identify the words or provide a better alternative. As is traditional, the team currently bringing up the proverbial rear go first, so uh, Ian and Steve, to your marks. Imelda Marcos flies north to win what? More air miles. <laughs> Quite possibly, but not the right answer. Mm -hmm. To win the My Husband Killed Your Husband Award for the Philippines. <laughs> Support is the answer. It's democracy in action. It is incredible. It is incredible. If she fits the size six and a half, she gets to marry Prince Edward. <laughs> Next. Uh, <laughs> Lamont set to loosen what? Bowels. <laughs> 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 happily it's not correct. To loosen huge slush fund in order to bribe everyone and win the election. <laughs> really angry mood you're in. <laughs> angry young man. My name's Ian Hislop. Good night. <laughs> it's uh, public purse strings, is correct. Next, uh, White House runs out of what? Paint. <laughs> so they've got the uh, uh, colour of it, you know, <laughs> half pink. No. It's a lovely idea, but not yeah. true. <laughs> Southern comfort is the answer. Uh, next, Kaufman pledges no more what by Labour? Governments. <laughs> or no more socialism. Uh, socialism, no. Defence cuts is the answer. And finally, what in cells would prevent uh, prison mutiny, say experts? Uh, no, this, this is uh, cardboard cutouts of Captain Bly. <laughs> Excellent idea. That is true. Is it less prisoners? TVs is the answer. Uh, so... Well, they want to put transvestites in prison. <laughs> we shan't go into that. Now, uh, Paul and Michael, here are your missing words. A certain light motif running through this lot. I wonder if you can spot it. 
Uh, why, Who is My Hero by John Major. Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> City. <laughs> You'd think so, but um, it's not. Mandala. <laughs> 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 It's, well, you're not well, far you off. It's sort of, it's What's like, the prime minister? It's like Baldwin and Pitt. William Pitt. And, uh, uh, no, no, I'm going to give a point to Ian because it's Mr. Dull is the answer. Uh, next, uh, Major buys his £55 shirts from who? Imelda Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> is this a Harvey Proctor? <laughs> it's absolutely right, yes. Yeah. So it is, isn't it? Mr. Yeah. TV himself. I'll give, you the, I'll give you that. The answer is disgraced Tory, but it was Harvey Proctor. Uh, next, Major rules out Heseltine what? Sex change? <laughs> the, uh, yeah, um, job? Mm, move job. is the right job. answer. Yes. Hairdresser's charter. Uh, <laughs> ma major set for triple one. A uh, bypass uh, operation. Vodka? Uh, <laughs> defeat. Look at bigamy charts. A defeat is correct, well done. And lastly, Tories tell Major to take a what? A flying mm. leap. Let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, take a ticket and wait for your number to be called. <laughs> 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 Not even likely. Right. Rest. Tough line is the right tough answer. Line. <laughs> At the end of that enthralling battle of half wits, the upshot of it all is that this week's bitter disappointments are uh, Ian and Steve with 12, and this week's uh, credit to their mothers are Paul and Michael with 22. <laughs> So, a 21-gun salute for our winners and a couple of bullets through the temple for our losers. But uh, before all that, we just have time for our caption competition. Paul and Michael, what do you think of for this? 50-foot woman terrorises London. Or... <laughs> Maggie's <laughs> back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ian and Steve, let's have a look at yours. That's uh, President Bush and ex-President Carter playing miniature golf. <laughs> 20 points. <laughs> it's, it's too late now. I think it's the royal princes saying, is this all we have to do for the next 50 years to pick up the check? <laughs> Very good, on which treacherous note, uh, we say thank you to our guests, Ian Hislop and Stephen Frost, and Paul Merton and Michael White, and I leave you with the news that education chiefs have once again expressed fears that drug taking may be on the increase in Britain's schools. <laughs> Following calls for his resignation from the corn hunt, Prince Charles talks it over with members of his immediate family. <laughs> As a reward for good behaviour, the jailed Marquis of Blandford is given the job of parking the governor's car. <laughs> and finally, more bad news concerning Gaza's injury crisis. Medical experts fear his head's coming off. <laughs> good night. Our favourite newsreader Trevor MacDonald joins the Jolly Fellows in Wednesday night show at the same time, 11 o'clock. But now, there's a multiple rapist on the loose in Forensic Files, next.